Revelation chapter 3, looking at the Church of Philadelphia, we will focus in on uh, verses 8 and 9, and um, this is the model church, so that's, therefore we should, Smyrna and Philadelphia, the only two churches that the Lord doesn't put any indictment, any displeasure, Philadelphia, uh, surely this great model church, we should look and go, how do I model this in my life personally? How do we as a church model it corporately as we look at this? And verse 7, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door. No one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. It's amazing of what God can do with a little strength. We're going to see three things today. And interestingly, um, one of the, well, the last week we, we looked at he who is holy, he who is true, has the key of David. That's the right to the king of kings, the uh, Lord of lords. He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. As we looked at that, uh, <coughs> and deep dive that last two weeks. This week, we're going to look at these three things that made this church why God opened the door. And it's so interesting, the three things that he speaks is you have a little strength, so you kept my word, and you have not denied my name. But one of those, you have a little strength, is actually one of the statements of power for us that we would recognize we do not need to be this great power. You know, we live in a world, and everything about it is power, might, talent, skill, and all these things. And yet, God is speaking to this church and saying, I'm going to open up these doors for you because you have a little strength. And we're going to look at what that means. We're going to, I'm going to open these doors because... You keep my word. We're going to look at that, the vitalness, especially the day that we live. And thirdly, because you won't deny my name and the power behind that. So again, Father, I bless you and I praise you. Would you open a door that no man can shut? Open this word that no man can shut, including myself, who will deliver this our very flesh who will easily be distracted by the cares of the world and the things that are before us for the day, the week, the weekend. And Lord, would you shut that devil as he wants to come, steal, kill, and destroy. Pluck a seed away so it doesn't take a root. Shut that door and open one for us. and Let it be in spirit and truth, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> In uh, last week's study, but must recap it in that the open door is that this church, as we see historically, it's the open door to the mission. And the mission is to take the world and declare the heart of God, that God loves you. That's the gospel. And then then there's a layer of, well, how do I have a personal relationship with with him, and it's through the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who stepped down, became the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world, and trade places that we could put our sin on him as a lamb down at the temple, and transfer our guilt and shame, and he would take it there upon the cross, and take it and bury it into a grave, and rise again on the third day, and declare forgiven and put away. And it's a whole life behind it, and it looks like something, and it's beautiful. But that's the heart of God for man. And then God says, I want to give you my heart. 
And that's what he's going to speak to you. I'm going to trust this church with my greatest treasure. It's the gospel. It's my love. It's my declaration to man that I love you, I'll forgive you, and that you can come and have a personal relationship with me. Well, we see and we studied, but Acts 14, 27, now when they had gathered together, and we're going to let the Scripture interpret the Scripture, our inductive Bible study method, observation, interpretation. We're going to let the interpretation be this very Bible. Now when they had come and gathered the church together they reported all that god had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the gentiles first corinthians 16 but i will tarry in ephesus until pentecost for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries our brother paul second corinthians 2 furthermore when i came to troas to preach christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the lord Colossians 4 3, meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in chains. But there's this place that God will block, and we've been there in missions where, hey, we really feel this is where God wants us to go, but all the doors closed. Then the next thing we know, this other field opens, and wow, we are so amazed how you opened this door. Well, the same thing would happen to Paul, so we're in good company, all of us. Acts 16, 6, now when they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Lord, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and the man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. God opens and God closes. And it's exciting to consider where he would open and close for us personally, corporately, and uh, in, in the mission field across the street or the mission field across the sea or the mission field even within our very home as we look at that. But I recap that and go back to that because it's so vital for this understanding as we study our verses today and look at the three things of this church, why he would open the door for them, that they had a little strength, they kept his word, and they did not deny his name. But last week I said, and this week I'll say it again, I would pray that you would pray that you would ask the Lord, who's my one? Oh, we're going to take opportunities across all who God would bring to our path. But if we would pray, Lord, would you put on my heart one that I will pray faithfully for and pray that you would open this door for me to step into and be able to share and speak to them. Anybody read one of the greatest books? It's called Tortured for Christ. It's about a man of sacrifice, Richard Wormbrand. And um, Richard Wormbrand, uh, several decades ago, Romania, communism, brutality, locking up Christians. They took him, put him in a prison, beat continually. And all he had to do was deny Christ. And they would let him go. But he preached Christ after he was released, after 14 years, I think, it of the brutality. He would go from church to church. He couldn't even wear shoes. I even met people who heard him speak. They go, he'd have to come up to the pulpit in bare feet because when he was um, in prison, they would continually beat his feet. They would tie him up and they would take a, 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 a stick, a bat, and just beat his feet senselessly. And even to the very day when he got out, the torture. But he never denied Christ. He became this great witness for Christ. But you know how he came to Christ in Romania? He was, um, there was a man who gave his life to Christ. (laughs) 
there's a man who gave his life to Christ in Romania. He was, lived in one of 12,000 towns of Romania. And he said, Lord, if Jesus was the Jewish carpenter who gave his life for me, would you bring one Jewish man into my life that I could lead to Christ? Richard Wormbrand was of the Jewish heritage, lineage, a staunch atheist, he will tell you in his writing. And of the 12,000 towns that he could live in, for whatever reason, he said, I moved to this town where this man lived. And this man, when he met him, he was the only Jewish man, like, in the whole town. And after his conversion, Richard Wormbrand would tell the story. He goes, that man courted me like a man would court a bride. The love that he gave me, the, the intention that he gave me, and, the, and just continually the love that he gave me. He just wore me down to the place that I saw that Jesus Christ and the love of Christ was real and that I saw what God did in him and wanted that into my life. One man, but that man will tell the story that he prayed. Once he met Richard Wormbrand, he prayed fervently that he would open the door. Here we are in our passage that he would be able to lead Richard into the arms of Christ. And that's the prayer that I have. And I pray that you would just get away and go, Lord, who would be my one? I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you, bring them into my life. Well, it started in verse 7, into the church in Philadelphia, right? So again, the context for what's important as what we're going to develop today um, as we look at this, Philadelphia, phileo, three words in the Greek for love. Phileo is brotherly love. This city of Philadelphia was established by a Grecian um, leader, uh, governor type, and he established this city. He passed away, but he had such a deep and loving relationship with his brother that his brother came and made sure that the city was established. I believe that's how the city actually got renamed to Philadelphia so that it would be known and tagged phileo, brotherly love, because the younger brother had such a love for the older brother. He wanted the city to let all know of his brotherly love. And isn't it just this beautiful picture of what the Lord does with the church and how he puts those things together? Jesus would speak to us. And again, from the gospel's sake, these three things were the strength that we're going to talk about. But these three things, the brotherly love and the mission that was sent forth was the the core of what we see here and jesus would say a new commandment i give to you that you love one another as i have loved you that you also love one another by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another when i was in russia 1993 and i know i say this it's impossible for me to want to see destruction upon Russia. Do I want to see Vladimir Putin come to an end? Absolutely. I was in Ukraine in 1995. I walked among the churches. I fellowshiped among believers, just like I do right here. And when I was in Russia in 95, we were going from town to town doing inductive Bible studies because they didn't have, there was no internet, there was no commentaries. All they had was a Bible, if they were lucky, and a pen. We went in and taught them the inductive Bible study. And we teach that here uh, about every six months. So be on the lookout for our next session that comes up because it's just so profitable on letting the word unveil itself to us and to our hearts. But we had a psalm that we continued, Lee sang and said together, Psalm 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. 
It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. It was just beautiful. Behold how good and blessed it is when brethren dwell together. There was no communism remembrance. There was no difference between Americans and Russians. There was just one thing that we all had this in common, that we loved Jesus and we all came together and we celebrated Jesus and we had this pleasant fellowship together. But what I say about it, one of the most beautiful pictures of brotherly love, and it's my continual heart's desire for all of us, that all will know our love one for another. It was brotherly love that made the people in Philadelphia, as they would pass through this town, realize there is a love there that cannot be denied. We had finished our session four days Finished it at 5, 6 o'clock. We stayed in the same hotel together. We ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. It was just four days of total immersion. And this particular one was a rather large session. There had to be several dozen people, which was fast. God opened a door. As much as they tried to shut the door, the Orthodox Church in Russia and the Russian government, God opened a door for a bunch of nobodies in America. And we went in and we got to teach. And a couple of those very men now pastor churches in Russia that are leading hundreds, have hundreds of people in it. But the session was over. It's, um, I think it's only October, but it starts to snow probably in Russia in like July. <laughs> it's so... I remember one guy telling me it was snowing, it was overcast, it was gray. He said, uh, Ree, um, one day we had weather like, one time we had weather like this for 12 months. I go, um, I go, you, you mean like 12 weeks? He goes, no, 12 months. Overcast, gray, rainy, cold, and I can say, man, I know what he, I seen it and I experienced it, but we packed up. We were heading to our next conference, uh, a train ride, overnight train ride away. We had like one hour of car and transportation to get down to the train station. And so we, our Americans were Let's be honest, we're well-funded. We were able to take easy means of transportation to get down there. We get down there, and we unload. We're on the platform, uh, and the train is you know, now there. And then we're sitting there, and our interpreter, we're like, well, we're going to say goodbye to our interpreter. And um, we were literally like, let's, let's hold hands and pray. And as we then look and we start seeing these, all these brothers and sisters coming down from above the street level, all these people, it was literally every last one who came to the conference, several dozen, all of them came down. They were, fl they were just pouring in. Here's what we knew. They couldn't take the easy means of transportation like us. You hold up a dollar bill and a car stops and it drives you down there. They would have had to take the bus for a dime and then change and take the next bus for a dime. And some of them even walked the whole distance. But they were not going to let us leave without saying goodbye in that final farewell of the city. And there's all these people coming down. And I just remember the, the beauty of seeing these faces. And then our circle of prayer got bigger, 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 and bigger. And we got this big, huge, and I don't remember the song, but I think it was, Behold how good and blessed it is when brethren dwell together. We just have this wonderful worship. It's darkness. The lights are dim, street lights, and snow is falling through the lights. But here's what was so amazing to me, and it's a story that I tell, that I believe John 13 is true. When brethren, when the world sees our love one for another, that um, 
the Russian hockey team, the national hockey team, was on our bus. And there was only maybe a four to six foot walkway at this point beside us to get to the train because we took up the whole platform. And here comes the Russian hockey team. They're big boys. Oh, yeah. They got their gear packed on them, make them even bigger. And I can see them coming. And of course, raised in America of Russia, Russian men. And the most amazing thing happened. A whole hockey team, 30, 40 members, they all got into a single foul. And they fouled past us in silent reverence. Not talking anymore, not pushing us out of the way. Then they all got on the train and they all put the window down. And I'll never forget looking. And looking in that train, I could tell you like I'm looking at it right now. And all these windows are coming down in the train, just like a school bus in America. And all these Russian men's faces are sticking out. And they just watched. Because they have never seen anything like that in their life. Ever. This is Russia, 1993. The walls had just come down of communism, of atheism. You know what, church? It's true today. The world does not know what love is. We are living in the most divided nation of our time. Anyone who, regardless of how long you've lived on, in this America, all of us will agree this is the most divided nation that we've ever seen in our lifetime. Even those of you that have lived through the 60s and 70s, what we see today. And we'll see more of it as this political landscape keeps coming into a, an election year. But oh, how good and blessed it is. This is the greatest gospel that is preached, the love of the church. And he says to them in verse 8, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. It's the door of the gospel as we've seen. Love, and the world sees it. For you have a little strength. Can I tell you this? God is drawn to weakness. Read these Gospels. And when you watch Jesus come into a room, who does he always go after? The person who had the greatest need. The withered hand, the paralytic, the blind. We see God is drawn and he speaks these words to us. And I think there's such a word that we live in, especially the day that we are living in. And it can carry over. Man's philosophy, worldly wisdom carries over into the church. And it's the strongest. It's the most talented. It's the one who can speak the best or whatever it may be. And they come across with everything, got it together. And yet hear what God speaks to them. And he never puts any condemnation on this church. So I know since he doesn't, then I know that what he's saying to them, here's one of your powers. And this is one of your powers, whether it's your marriage or your ministry. Here's one of the greatest power when we simply go, you know what, Lord? I'm weak. I know in me is no strength. And our brother will tell us in 1 Corinthians ten twelve. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand takes heed, lest he fall. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He continually gives us that the power in our lives is simply coming to, Lord, I don't have the power to do any of this. I don't have the power, as we read last week, I don't have the power to be holy but I choose, I desire, that's the word choose, I desire to be holy. And there's a power in that. The power comes in that the Lord would speak. But are you willing to be willing? Because there's a place we can go, but I'm not willing to be holy. I'm not willing, you fill in the blank. But when we come to, you know what, Lord? Yeah, I'm willing to just be willing. 
And he says, then I'll give you the power. And that's where we come to this brokenness and we come to these things and we're given as we studied the, as, um, the key of David that goes back to Isaiah 22. We've studied that for a couple of weeks. It was, a, it was a, a treasurer for the kingdom of David. He had the key to the treasury and therefore he had the power to open it up and give it to whoever he would. And that's what the Lord's speaking. I have the key in Ephesians chapter 1. I have the key to the spiritual inheritance. Anything, all the spiritual blessings of heaven. And that's where wealth is, the spiritual inheritance. I have all the spiritual inheritance to give to you. I have the key. I can open it. And then we come to, Lord, just to open it. Because I'm too weak to open these things. You know, I look at it as um, in my little strength that I have, it's amazing, like every one of us, I can still carry five people. And we go, how can that be? All I have to do is take this car key, turn an ignition, and I can carry five people a thousand miles. And that's how I, we see these type of things. You know, I don't have this great strength. And the Lord says, you just get in and ride with me. All you got to do is have this little strength, just enough to turn the key, and I'll carry these things for you, and you simply come and be drawn to me. We say it all the time, prayerlessness is our declaration of independence. I don't need to pray. I don't need to seek the Lord. I don't need to be diligent about these things because I got this. But when we truly come to weakness and that I can't change anything, I'll never lead a Richard Warmbrand, a staunch atheist to the Lord or anyone else in my life. But when I come and say, you know what, Lord, you can open and you can unlock this, unlock this man, unlock these things in my life, in their life, and you can move these mountains. But I have just a little strength. And the Lord says, that's all you need is just this little bit of strength. Do you believe this? Because see, our lives will reflect it. And so for you, for me, the question comes to, well, what do I need strength for today? Because I can simply come, you know what, Lord? This is where I need strength in my life. And you fill in that blank as you come to the Lord. And the Lord says, all you need is a little strength. I am drawn to a little strength. But when we come, I got this strength. I got this. I'm good. Then the Lord's like, then I'll let you take it from here. But he goes on and he says, Uh, You have kept my word. Verse 7, here's what we know was the keeping of their word uh, as we read through this. He who is holy. And then he'll come on to say that the next part, you have not denied my name. And here's the power. Here's the power for all of us. The word of God was non-negotiable to them. I find it so interesting to me is that um, I was police chaplain here in the county for 15 years, and they, I was one of the last chaplains they brought on. I had, they hadn't brought on a new chaplain for several years, and they're interviewing me, and they're asking me these things, and um, it wasn't until later that I found out, like at the end of the interview, oh, well, we're interviewing you because we're looking for, we want to make sure that we have chaplains to cover every denominational style that we have. And you fit the, we, we believe you fit that um, fit for our fundamental Christians. It was rather shocking to me because if you get it, I was like, fundamental Christian. Here's the definition of a fundamental Christian. A conservative system of theology which historically has held five major tenets of faith. Miracle of Christ, miracles of Christ, that God still does miracles. Virgin birth of Christ, substitutionary atonement of Christ, meaning the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, lay in your hand, and the bodily resurrection of Christ. And then fifthly, which is one of the big ones, the inspiration of the Scriptures, that the Word of God is the Word of God. 
Do you know a recent Barna research? Uh, Barna, they do these polls within the church and these type of things. Do you know 52% of the professing evangelical church, and they do a sample that gets enough sampling, 52% of professing evangelicals, which should fall into what I just read here, do not believe that the Bible is the inspired final word of God. They believe that much and many of it is man wrote it. Here's what you come down to. This is 52%. Therefore, it's impossible for them to believe that the word of God is non-negotiable. This church, the word of God was non-negotiable. Be holy as I am holy. They did not, even under the pressure that we're going to read before we finish out, they were under this pressure and persecution from this synagogue of Satan that we'll talk about, and yet they would never yield, and they would. What's non-negotiable to you regarding the word of God? Thou shalt not murder. I think we all go, yeah, that's non-negotiable, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jesus would say, if you have hatred in your heart towards a brother, I consider you guilty of murder. Would we consider that non-negotiable? Or would we say, this is non-negotiable. I cannot harbor these type of feelings towards my brother because of brotherly love that we're called to. Lord, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to sit here until you change my heart because I can't get up and leave here and have murder in my heart. And take any word, and I pray that the Lord starts speaking to you right now of a specific word, because I could go on example after example, but I'm asking the Lord to speak to you, that maybe there's a word that right now you're going, well, this is kind of negotiable. Me and Rene were talking of just how interesting it is of watching Christendom today uh, start to apply situational ethics. It's okay to lie in this situation. And God says, thou shalt not lie. You're not to bear false witness. Well, see, in this certain situation, it's acceptable. And they put in a situational where I go, you know, life's real easy for me. Everything in the word of God just becomes non-negotiable. Um, Edinburgh University Library there in England, I remember reading this story. Uh, the librarian asked the professor, so your class, your students have been assigned to do this research, and they're supposed to do this topic, so um, how far back do you want us to draw these books and because they would take these books from out of the basement and bring them up you know just like our library of congress if you ever go down and, and enjoy that they come and they'll bring you the books for your research and they go how far back should we go and the professor and it's so fitting it's it's just so fitting for the word that we live in the world that we live in he said don't go back any further than 10 years i don't want any books that are older than 10 years and his point was because the positions and opinions after 10 change and those of 10 years ago really are old and outdated so we only want the modern thoughts and the modern position and it's just what a great picture that we see here in christianity with well the word of God was outdated. It goes way back. And I love, and here's a, here's a word for us, for every last one of us. In Exodus 3, you know the story. The burning bush, Moses turns aside. And what does the Lord say to him? Because the Lord's going to speak to him. Take off thy sandals, for you're standing on holy ground. This church of Philadelphia, they could have brotherly love. They could go through doors that God was opening for them because they knew they only had a little strength, but they knew by the word of God where the strength came and where strength arised from. But they kept his word. And you know what? Holy, holy, holy. 
uncommon God. And when Moses came and God said, take off thy sandals, you're standing on holy ground. You know, there's a place for us that we can start taking this word and it just becomes common. It just becomes, oh, I read my Bible, I read three chapters a day. Or even I go to a Bible study or I come here. Have you ever wonder why we, if you would, put such a structure around our Bible study? It's because we believe this is holy ground. And God's calling us, take off your sandals and come and stand before me and come into this holy ground. Psalm 138, the Lord says, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above your name. And we know in Philippians 2 that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And yet he says, I put my word above my name. And there's just a place that the Lord just speaks. He goes, when you open your Bible, Christian, it's holy ground. God is inviting us into an intimacy. And as he invited Moses, it's no different than when he invites us. Whether it's your personal Bible study or in here, the Holy God says, I want to speak something to you. And it's going to be holy. It's going to be uncommon. It's not going to be anything like the world. And this was the power of this church. And the third point that we see here that he will speak and you have not denied my name. Which is interesting, for we know, and here, here's what he's speaking to this church. We, we know from the study there in Sardis, as we looked, it says, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. So Sardis, that church down the road, everybody knew Sardis. It had a name, that was the church to be in. Here he's speaking, that he's saying that, this church, you haven't denied my name. They weren't into their name. They were into his name. And there is the power that comes from, we just want to lift the name of Jesus. And they weren't care, caring about their um, name of their church. They weren't caring about their wealth or their prosperity or their building and these type of things. And what we read here in verse 9, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. This synagogue of Satan, it was the synagogue. Synagogue simply is a meeting place. And here Here's what the Lord is calling it. It was a meeting place of the devil. And there come in the devil and all those people who are meeting in a so-called religious way. They're coming to attack this church of Philadelphia. And yet the church of Philadelphia would not waver. The church of Philadelphia would stay faithful to what the word of God is, to the name of God and to the character of God. And here's the power. I'm going to open a door for you. And I'm going to give you my greatest treasure. I'm going to give you and entrust you with the gospel that you can go out and you can tell a world. This is the model church. They had a little strength, and their power was, I know I just have a little. There was a model church, but my, the word that you give me is non-negotiable. Nothing moves off of this. And I will not deny your name even when the battle comes against, I think of Paul, the door open, I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost for a great effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. As I close with the, here on this point, this meeting place, the meeting of the so-called experts, filled with lies, and they couldn't, whatever it was, they couldn't stand the Church of Philadelphia. It's just, most of the commentators believe it wasn't a large church. That's why little strength, little influence. It wasn't like Sardis, which is interesting. There's no mention of a synagogue of Satan coming against the Church of Sardis. They were known in all the town, but Jesus knew they were dead. But here's this church, 
Little influence, that's one of the words that little meant, of little influence. You didn't have a powerful influence, and yet here the devil cannot stand it. And here the devil must keep coming against them. And the devil's coming to tear this church down because whatever it is, the meeting place, these so-called experts are coming and saying, we're the experts, and let me tell you, that's not the proper way to God. That's not that where God is meeting and this attack that comes in. Here's, here's the summation of the point because I know we're hitting our time period here. If you choose to walk through any door that God opens, any, you want to walk in and you want to walk into an open door that God opens for a, for a relationship that's godly. You want to walk in and walk into a door that God opens for any type of ministry that's going to bring glory to God. If you want to walk in and step out and choose to serve Lord in whatever ministry, or step out and take what God calls you into a mission field, here's what you can be sure of. When the devil sees that God has opened a door for you, he's going to come and want to shut it. It's impossible for him to shut it, Because it says it can't be shut. So here's what the devil will do. I know I can't shut it, but if I can just distract you and keep you from going through that door. So here's what the devil will do. He will start fire after fire after fire in your life. And when you go after to put out fire after fire, and here's one of the fires, they're lying about them they could go from fire and fire and fire and say let me dispel the lie that these synagogue of satan are saying about my church about me about this person over here and if satan sees that it works he will just start fire after fire after fire but here's a place of great faith that god's speaking to us and he says to these people i will take care of that listen church of philadelphia I'll take care of that. And some of them are going to come. It's not going to worship at your feet, before your feet. They're going to be worshiping alongside of you. And here's another powerful application. When the people of the synagogue of Satan, they don't know the Lord, and they're coming against you to tear down the open door that God has given you, if you blow them up, they'll never come. And I mean blow up their character, blow up, you know, their personage, they're never going to come and worship beside you. But this church didn't get wrapped up in that. This church just kept faithful to the word, did not deny his name, just kept their brotherly love. And here these people are coming. Some of these people are coming and they're going to say, whatever that is, like a Russian hockey team, putting down the window and just looking and going, whatever that is, I've never seen anything like it. Whatever is there is not like anything that's out here. And they will come and they will worship beside us. But the Lord is speaking to us. And he goes, I'll take care of that. And he's given them a promise. You just keep doing these three things. Recognize your weakness. And that I have the strength. Keep my word. Make it non-negotiable. And do not deny my name, regardless of the war and the pressure that comes upon them. I read a uh, true story, and I just a beautiful, fitting story to end for our time here today. And um, Jordan, you can come on up, and let's get ready to worship the Lord. But there was a there was a woman. A young a woman and she was blind and she was given a braille copy of the gospel of mark true story and she just loved reading through braille the gospel of mark the savior the story the beauty of him but through circumstances beyond her control her nerve endings of her fingers were slowly deteriorating to a point that she no longer had a feel in her fingertips. 
And she would try as she would. She could no longer feel those braille words. And she could no longer read. And her story that she tells, she said, and it was sad and it was heartbreaking to me. And I knew that my end had come for my braille reading. She goes, but I love this word. She goes, and I put the word up to my lips and I said, oh, beautiful word, I kiss you goodbye. And she said, and when I put my lips to the page of the braille, I found out that my lips could sense the bumps of the braille. And she said, and so I started to read the word of God with my lips. And it was a beautiful thing. And I read that story and I go, you know, I just find it such a beautiful correlation for us as we, when we put the word of God on our lips, think about it. And I'm going to speak the word of God that's on my lips to my wife. What words are going to come out? These beautiful words. When I put the word of God on my lips and I speak the word to my brothers, my sisters, what words do we sing? What word do we speak as I think of seeking, speaking spiritual psalms and hymns one with another? And when we put the word of God on our lips and we go out and we share it with people who have never heard of this type of love, and we demonstrate it like this church of Philadelphia. What words, what a beautiful, what a beautiful word. And there's something to be said here again. My greatest treasure is this gospel that I share, that there's a means that man can have a relationship with me. And I'm going to entrust it with you that you'll go and share. He didn't open a door to wealth and fame and prosperity. He opened a door for them to put the word of God on their lips and go declare it to a people, even an enemy in the synagogue. Father, that you would do the same for us. These three things, Lord, they're really um, ABCs. And we think we need something great or marvelous and we have uh, to go do some extra long journey to find strength. But here you give us these three things, real simple. We just have a little strength. But when we're weak and know it, then we are strong because your grace is sufficient. And Lord, your word just be non-negotiable, holy ground every time. Every time, in every situation. And Lord, we don't deny your name, regardless of the situation. As that missionary said, only one life to live, and soon it shall be past. Only what's done for Christ shall last. Lord, may we seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added on to us. Would you put your word on our lips and Lord, as you open the door in our homes, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, and across the sea, let the word of God just penetrate the love of God to a lost world, to a hurting world. And I pray this in your name. Amen.